Good afternoon, everybody. I see there we again have uh, English speakers in the audience, so we'll do everything in English. Um, I would very much uh, like to uh, introduce you to uh, my good friend Ion, who is uh, uh, working for uh, uh, an association called Kafka Brigade, where he is uh, trying to make a more visible note on uh, uh, things that go wrong in our government, uh, not only on the digital, but also on the uh, social and organizational uh, uh, level of things. Um, and I've asked him to present um, the findings he uh, wrote of in uh, the new book called The Digital, Digital Cage, uh, to give you a short outline, because I think it's uh, something that touches uh, the line of work that uh, the normal audience of the Dutch uh, Unit User Group uh, are working in on a lot of points. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Arjen, would like to take it away? Yes, thank you, Koen. My name is uh, Aya Wittlak, I have uh, an organization called the Kafka Brigade Foundation and with it uh, we research dysfunctional bureaucracy. And uh, of course this is a way to be sure you'll never be unemployed, uh, but it's also a mission. The Kafka Brigade is a, a network of uh, researchers, consultants, scientists that share a vision on government being that bureaucracy is not only a way of organizing work, it's also a system of values, a way to organize certain values. And of course, the public value where organizations are there for in the first place, eh? teaching children something for schools, making uh, cure people for hospitals, but also the fundamental values of the liberal democracy, eh? like legal certainty and con con continuity, and integrity uh, and transparency and we share a way of working uh, the Kafka Brigade method uh, which is in essence uh, that we look at the problem of a citizen with all the organizations uh, involved and that is also what I would like to do uh, with all of you today uh, I'm going to tell you uh, for certain about one case, but perhaps if we have time uh, to, and ask ourselves what actually happened here, what changed in the way we work that might have caused all these uh, problems. And I believe that looking from the perspective of a citizen is essential uh, to view the whole of uh, the problem. Uh, of course we are named uh, after Franz Kafka, this is this guy. I uh, won't tell you anything about him because we don't have time for that. This is in essence the, the, the Kafka method. But what I want to talk to you about today is the influence of uh, ICT on the way government is organized. Uh, which is also called the digital transformation of government. And two elements are very important I think. One is that since the 90s uh, government organizations, especially uh, non-governmental public bodies, for who speaks Dutch, ZBO's, uh, which translates as non-governmental public bodies, started to make uh, decisions automatically. Uh, and nowadays, uh, every, every 17 seconds, uh, a traffic violation uh, is picked up by a camera, which means a sanction is fully automatically uh, uh, made. Uh, our tax office gets almost six million requests for income dependent uh, surcharges. Uh, the UEV, which is called in English the Employee Insurance Agency, uh, decides about 17 million uh, continuity, uh, income continuity decisions a year. More than half, uh, 156 billion euros a year, more than half of government's income, is redistributed automatically without any human involvement. 
But apart from the fact that government has become a decision machine, uh, it also started to exchange data on a very large uh, scale. And this combination of making decisions based on the information of other organizations we call automated network decisions. Uh, they are sometimes also called chain decisions. I think this is a wrong word. Uh, this is, of course, by analogy to uh, supply chain management. But in the private sector, there's always an endpoint. Uh, there is always a, a product that is used by a consumer, and from that you can reconstruct the chain. While in government, the product, of course, is a decision. And the decision is all, uh, quite often be fed re, uh, back into the system as a datum, even before the citizen is even aware of it. For example, when the tax office uh, estimates your income, but it estimates it a bit high, and you go to the judge to fight this uh, estimate of the tax office, and you need a social lawyer, and you need finance for that because, hey, they estimated your income too high. Whether you get this social lawyer or not uh, is found in the registry uh, of incomes. Uh, and you won't get this social lawyer because of this same estimate. <laughs> and so this is a circle, way of circling, circle reasoning. This never happens in the private sector because the products are usually tangible. It was that this is also large scale. Uh, in 2015, uh, an overview was made uh, in, uh, uh, at the request of our Senate, at uh, the Eerste Kamer. In 2015, there were 180 registrations managed by 15 organizations and shared with 180 other organizations. In total, there were 495 uh, uh, data exchange points. Uh, at a single registration, the data is sometimes delivered to more than 2,000 other organizations. So, also data exchange has become the core of uh, our public sector. And just to make sure that uh, you know how I'm, how, how I'm standing into this, I'm not against rules, huh? people think that sometimes of the Catholic Brigade, not against bureaucracy, not against ICT, but of course I am against not thought through ICT, dysfunctional bureaucracy and rules that are so large that you can't possibly comprehend them. Because rules are tools in the sense that the best invention of the last century perhaps was a simple rule, the dimensions of a container. And we had, uh, was that your feelings? We had traffic jams in our, in our ports a century ago and now a bottle of wine is at one cent transport cost on your table. All because we can coordinate uh, our behavior by rules without communication. That's in the essence of what bureaucracy is. It's your <coughs> organized work around a registration that makes it transferable and makes it easy to coordinate the work without any communication. For a large part, it is also what automation is, what software is. You organize uh, work, yeah, the algorithm around the registration, around the data. Of course, dysfunctions, we always had dysfunctions. Yeah? This is a simple uh, overview of the key principles of a bureaucracy, and we always had uh, ways of uh, doing this wrong. I think all these dysfunctions are quite familiar, and what we are going to look at is are there new kinds of dysfunctions? Because on the one hand, of course, there are great gains. Uh, for example, if you have a police officer, and yes, I know this is not a police officer, I will change the picture. Uh, if a police officer finds a car that is stolen and he uh, registers that in uh, the general registration of license plates, he not only works for the police, he in fact also works for the RDW, the Dutch DMV, 
because they can send a request to have this car checked every year <coughs> again. And this police officer also works for the tax office because they will send you an invoice for your uh, uh, well tax to have a car. Don't, don't know what it's called. Road tax, thank you. And so his productivity, in fact, uh, becomes three times as high. Of course, you will notice that in his monthly income, which is too bad for a police officer, uh, but it is true. So, let me first tell you a, a, a little story that has not that much to do with ICT, but just to get a feel for the kind of problems uh, we might be talking about. These are the inhabited islands uh, Rotterdam Oog and Rotterdam Plaat. They are part of the municipality of Eemsmond, uh, but we have a non-governmental public body, Staats Bosbeheer, that actually takes care of these islands. And on a certain day, the municipality wrote a letter to the Staats Bosbeheer, and they said, please uh, put uh, street names on these uh, inhabited islands. Uh, why did they ask that? They said, well, there is a law, uh, a law on uh, the basic administrations of addresses and buildings. And this law says that every uh, uh, object where people can uh, re have residence in should be located at a street with a house number. Um, and there is a place where you can reside on this island. This is a... Uh, uh, a bird counting uh, building and every summer there are two bird counters residing in this uh, place hence there is a uh, an object hence there has to be a street name with a house number <laughs> yeah. obvious <laughs> so what always uh, uh, hits me when people uh, take rules or rules as their axiom it invites other people to do the same. So Staats Bosbeheer wrote back to the municipality, well, listen, uh, the mail for these people, we, now with volunteers we bring the mail, but if we have to uh, place street names, the municipality has to make sure mail is delivered on the <laughs> <laughs> Of course. And there was an inhabitant of uh, the municipality of Amesmond, and he looked a bit closer in the municipal, municipal regulations, and he said, well, for safety, uh, there is this rule in the regulations that says that house numbers have to be visible from the public road. <laughs> <laughs> Which is 10 kilometers uh, away. <laughs> so, oh, this is not good. I forgot to translate this, I guess. The rest was in English, wasn't it? Okay, thanks. What you see happening in this example, because this has a kind of a Monty Python quality, uh, we, we immediately understand this is nonsense, this is absurd, a waste of time, a waste of money. But usually, the, the, the key thing you have to do is make the absurd visible, because when things become more complex, People just won't see the absurd element. Uh, the second thing that, is, that we always see is that general rules require room for judgment. And one of the reasons that is so is because the interaction of rules, uh, the interplay of rules, very quickly leads to unforeseen uh, consequences. Um, and how you uh, justify exceptions is not always clear for people. And finally, everybody does it its best, but the addition of all these actions is not always a desired outcome. And even the, the elder one, eh, the wethouder, uh, in this case, he really thought he was doing the right thing. Eh? Have a look at YouTube where he's interviewed uh, by uh, Radio Noord. Uh, eh, he is sincere, he thinks he's doing the right uh, thing. So, let's have a look at a more complex case. Uh, this is Esther, Saskia. And Saskia has a, a little daughter. It, this case took some time, so right now it's quite a daughter. Uh, <laughs> she grew up. Uh, she had a job. She had a house. 
she had a car. And on a bad day, her car was stolen. So she went to the police office and said, well, hey, my car is stolen. And this was all recorded. She got a little piece of paper that said her car is stolen. Uh, and she went home. And sometime after, she received uh, a, uh, an invoice from the tax office to pay her road tax. And a little time later, she got a letter from the R. Uh, R D yeah, the Dutch DMV, that she had, uh, she needed to have her car checked. And that it's quite, that's quite difficult to do when you don't have the car. So she called to the tax office and they said, well, you have to go to the RDWE for your uh, registration because it's on your name. And uh, the, uh, the Dutch DMV said the same. And then she said, yeah, well, but my car is stolen. Oh, they said, then you have to go to the police. So she went to the police, and at the police station, they looked in the computer, and she thought, well, maybe my, my, my report from the, my car is stolen was just not yet processed. But they looked in the computer at the police station, couldn't find anything. So she went home, because what else could she do, right? And then another envelope uh, uh, found its way to her house from the CEIB, <laughs> which is, how do you call that uh, in Casso? Central Justice Investment. <laughs> okay, and, and perhaps in one word, what's the key word? <laughs> the money collector. The collector, the collector's office, yeah. The, 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 the collector's office. Because she didn't pay the road tax, and she did not have her car uh, checked. And of course, she also called to the collector's office, uh, but they also said, well, listen, when the car is in your name, you're responsible for its insurance, for etc., etc., and hence for all uh, the fines you receive if you do not comply. It took her a few years to get this uh, corrected, but eventually, she got the car from her name, all the invoices uh, stopped, and only three years after this, uh, I got to know Saskia, because she was still entangled in this problem, because all the money she had paid, which she did not need to pay because she didn't have the car, did not find her way back to Saskia. So we wrote an, uh, an email to the director of the Dutch DMV. We know him quite well, he was very cooperative, he sent over everything, and because you know something is wrong, you have a look at the details, and one thing we noticed is that the date her Saskia's car was placed back on her name was one day after she went to the police office, so we thought perhaps the car was found. So we went to the police and we asked, well, was the car found, can you look up uh, the file? They were not so cooperative. We went to the mayor, then they were very cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it turned out, indeed, the car was found the day after. And sorry, sorry, we just forgot to tell her. So <laughs> uh, they wrote a letter uh, uh, apologizing. And we thought, well, okay, solved, right? No. This was only the start of uh, uh, the story, actually, uh, because as automatically that all the requests to have the car checked again and the road tax, that all worked fine by itself, but when the correction was processed, nothing happened. And so Saskia and later we called to the tax office, well, can you restore all those road taxes paid? And they said, well, we can, that meaning that what's in the computer now, which was only five, uh, 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 five times, uh, is still in the computer, but the rest, it's not in the computer anymore, so uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, we can't. And also the Dutch DMV, they said, well, we can't uh, correct this retroactively, because this will uh, uh, corrupt the integrity of the registration. But they were willing to send a correction request to the collector's agency. And they did. 
And the collector's agency wrote back a letter that they did not process this correction request because the data were not in the system anymore. And uh, even more, beautiful quote, I thought, the money is already to The Hague, eh, where our government resides. And I thought, what a good argument. <laughs> Next time I get a, f get a fine, I can say, well, I was to the supermarket. I left my money there. Well, perhaps you can try over there. Beautiful argument. <coughs> so nothing happens. So how do we explain what, what happened here? Because something changed in the way government works. So in what way did things change? Any ideas? <coughs> How can we explain what happened here? Automated systems without control of the, of the process information. No manual input or manual, uh, you cannot uh, redirect it after it's been loose. And why? Why can't you redirect? Hey, why does it only work one way? Because they designed it that way. Mm. <laughs> It's designed in an imbalanced way. Yeah. Any idea why? Because I think it's true. Okay. Some things are automated, other things are not. Well, I, I, I think they wanted it to be in a way that it cannot be tampered with. So okay, you think it's fear of fraud? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, often, oftentimes that is true, but too bad, not in this case. The project became too expensive and I didn't want to implement the rest. <laughs> Almost, I'd, I'd say, because what, what, what makes the one thing more expensive than the other? What, what makes that this is the perspective? Because usually you hear everybody say, the citizen is the, is the center. Everybody. Nobody thought of it. What was it? No, they're not that stupid. <laughs> no. Usually ignorance is the best explanation for everything, I agree. Is it like confliction of rules? It's like you have the rule to lower the tax so to not keep the data too long? Well, the reason that uh, the data uh, uh, disappears partly uh, is because of law, uh, but only a, a fraction of it. Uh, being at the police office when they uh, when they retrieve the car, that data can only be kept for five years. For all the other data, there are exceptions in the law because the general rule is you have to get rid of it. But there are exceptions for basic administrations, uh, and there are also exceptions for the tax office. So your tax data is indefinitely in, in here. Okay. <laughs> so we know where it is, but... Are you going to tell us what happened to the car? Well, I had, I had this fantasy, but it didn't happen. Because I also thought, where is the car? Because nobody knew where the car was. Um, so I, I, I thought, well, let's see what they do in general. And in general, they put this under uh, the ring in Rotterdam. They have a large parking space at the police station. And I thought, well, if I just go there and I spot the car, I can say, well, there it is, you know, just like a purple crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it wasn't. Uh, it, I know from similar examples it's destroyed uh, within a year. Look at this being destroyed. Why is it not still a registration? Yeah, good question. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> because that is the second reason it should not be in her name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that a few things, especially what, what you, you said, is, is, is very interesting, is that the perception of what is costly and what is not costly is formed by the way we invest in IT. Because until 2003, 
all these uh, non-governmental public bodies were waiting for central government to make a plan on how to automate and what rules to adhere to. But in 2003 they said we're, we're going to stop waiting, we're just going to start. And what became the governance, eh, which was more or less forms evolutionary, is that every euro they invested in IT uh, came from their regular budget, which means it had, has to be uh, 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 come back in efficiency gains. And that made the driving force behind automation uh, efficiency, cost efficiency for the individual organization. So, for example, why did the, uh, uh, the Dutch DMV say this would corrupt the integrity of the data? That's not because they enjoy the beauty of an in, in, uh, the integrity of data set so much. Uh, that is because the tax office needs to have a legal basis for their decision. And this is cost efficient for the tax office. So they pay the Dutch DMV to do exactly that. Nobody pays for uh, the processing of a correction. So that is why that seems to cost more money. There is no business case for the interests of the citizen here. And so that's what drives the uh, governance. But a few other things uh, uh, happen. One of them is that uh, government becomes blind for the citizen in a, in a literal sense. And it, because you used to have to go with this paper of the police to the Dutch DMV and to the tax office. And then people actually saw the citizen. But now the data comes in without any contact with the citizen. The decision is made fully automatically. And also the decision goes out of the organization without any contact, which means if there are unreasonable outcomes or absurd outcomes. The only one who can view those things is the citizen, because the organization itself has become blind for it. And I think a, a third thing you'll notice here is that what I always call the snowball effect, is that a change in a single registration can cause actions at all kinds of other organizations organizations that a citizen has had no contact with at all. They come like uh, a deus ex machina, uh, so to say. And why is that relevant? That is relevant because in our, oh my god, how do you say that in English? Uh, rechtsbescherming? Legal protection. Yeah, the, the legal protection for citizens, perhaps something like that. I have to look it up. Uh, but usually you have legal protection. Uh, protection in the sense that if you get a decision, you can uh, uh, well appeal to that decision first just at the organization itself, later to a judge. But to do that, you have to know which organization is the cause. And there are very short terms in which you can appeal. And so in practice, the citizen had to reconstruct the ICT governance of the government to be able to act on its, its legal rights. Okay, let's make it a little bit more complex. Do we have time? What is the time? What is the time? Okay, I think we're gonna do this one more quickly. This is Esther, also a young woman, also uh, with, a, with a house of her own, her own car, uh, she's a motivational speaker, she travels the world uh, for her work, and on a certain day she becomes such a, a, a asked speaker that she's more abroad in all kinds of countries for her work uh, than she's at home in the Netherlands. And then she thinks, well, perhaps I can rent out my house because uh, I have a mortgage on my house, of course, and it's just cheaper to take a hotel. And if I'm uh, at my parents, I take a hotel near to my parents, and then when I'm going to France, near France. And she didn't ask if this was allowed because it was her own house. So why wouldn't it be allowed? So she rented out her house to two Japanese people, the boss of Mitsubishi Netherlands and his wife. 
these two Japanese people went to the municipality uh, to get registered at the municipality. And the person at the, the desk said, well, does this woman, does Esther live there uh, uh, herself still? He said, well, she has, of course, the key and uh, she has the ethic and there are some stuff of hers uh, is in the house. But if you ask, is she living there, living there, living there, ah, she's never there. <laughs> and that's a signal, a signal of fraud, possible fraud. And there's a procedure connected to this signal. In essence, uh, a little letter, a little visit, a little letter, a little visit, a little letter. And if one of these five steps goes wrong, evidently it's fraud. So, Esther uh, did not have to wait uh, uh, until she discovered this, until this procedure came to an end, because she needed a new passport. Because her father lives in the United States, she wanted to visit him uh, at his birthday, and she needed a new passport, and she did not get a new passport because her address was uh, in investigation. So she talks to the person at the desk, and later to his boss, and later to his boss's boss. And these were all nice people. They had, they had good contact, and they explained her everything. Uh, there is something which is called uh, the criterion for inhabitants, uh, and she is not enough in the Netherlands to be registered. Uh, at the municipality, uh, so she, she and she explained, well, yeah, but I'm not living abroad, I'm still living in the Netherlands, I'm just a, a lot away from my work, and well, she thought we understand, uh, we understand each other. But meanwhile, of course, the procedure just went on its way, and then a certain day, she got this letter, uh, well, we are uh, expecting to uh, write you out of the registry, uh, you can give a new address, uh, and otherwise, well, we will deregister you. And of course, she did not have another address. This was her address, and well, she was deregistered. And then the consequences came. First, the little consequences. She lost her parking permit. A little bit bigger consequences. She lost her mortgage uh, tax deduction. But she also lost her health insurance and her income addition for the health insurance. She was a, a single person business. She lost her tax returns number, which meant she could not uh, get the value added tax back. And of course she was registered in the Chamber of Commerce because this was located at her home address. She was deregistered there as well. In short, the whole fundament of her life was removed, uh, so to say. And then she went back to the municipality and said, well, I had no idea that this could, this could be the consequence of renting out my house. If I leave it empty, do I have, have, have I perhaps then solved my problem? <coughs> and he said, well, you just declared uh, here that you are less than 180 days in the Netherlands. So now that we know this, of course, we we have to check on that. You, you do understand that yourself, don't you? <laughs> what happened here? Of course, this is a bit more complex case. A lot more going on here. How do we explain what happened here? <coughs> accepted as a reason to further investigate this with a note, a visit, a note, a visit, and a note. Yeah, but it's, it's game over for Esther. She's, she's gone. She's gone. Say, say again? It's game over for her. She's out of the system now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, now it's game over. Yeah. They visit the address twice and, yeah. I think it's an action for Dutch government that everybody uh, has an address in the Netherlands. So if you don't have an address, 
basically everything, everything stops. It's, it's the same right for, for, for when you live in a vacation park, uh, where you can only live for, for, for 10 months out of 12, something, something like that. And you cannot be registered there. You have to be registered somewhere. This is exactly what I said the first time when I went to the, the Ministry of Interior Affairs in the Netherlands. Uh, because I, I, I'm not a legal scholar, so I didn't know at that time the details of the law, so I said exactly this. And he said, no, there are no legal rights nor obligations tied to this registration. So legally, there is no, and it's the same goes for vacation parks, and even there's the first jurisprudence, is that an English word? The first jurisprudence has just uh, been declared by a judge. Somebody lived at a vacation park. Obviously, as you said, hey, he was deregistered. But he said, for tax purposes, this is my main residence, and this was acknowledged uh, by the judge. So the legal connection formally is not there. Other explanations? Another example of uh, one-way uh, uh, rules. Uh, when you go abroad, you go abroad. You can't be in a, in a vacuum. Yeah, this is certainly this. What we just concluded had that there is a, a kind of a snowball effect is here, also the case. Yeah, many organizations use this data and assume it to be applying to their legal domain. Lack of knowledge by Esther and uh, all the other people in college? Yeah. <laughs> A lack of knowledge, exactly, by all the other people. Because there is nobody who knows how many organizations are connected to the citizens' registration. Is, is there even a, a default place of registration? Because I can imagine that it's correct that she's not supposed to be registered for that town because her residence is not in that town. But is then there some kind of virtual place that you can register if you're not living in any specific town? Or yeah, that's, that's just be, something that's not arranged. That's not arranged. That is what eventually the municipality said. That perhaps we need a kind of a virtual place for people who are not living abroad, but are a limited time in the Netherlands. And for that, the RNE, the registrations for people who do not live here, is put into life. But that's a whole other story. I need another <laughs> <laughs> uh, It's true. It's, it's something that is not, this, these cases, is not, it's not foreseen. But it's put us all this. Yeah, we can register more Partly. Partly, I think, could, could, could be part of the solution. I heard somebody else there? Yeah, we should register in Rotterdam ook. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> There's a street with a number and nobody's living there. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a whole group of people who actually don't want to be registered. True. Uh, there are probably also solutions already in place for that. Well, Basically, that's the funny uh, thing. There is, and because earlier somebody in the back said, hey, I hope the business case is fraud. When you say the business case is fraud, and there is a, a famous report uh, which uh, was about Amsterdam West, uh, where they found uh, what they called ghost youth. So youth you know is there, but is not registered anywhere because they had huge phone bills or something like that and they just did not want to be uh, found. And now there's a whole program which is called uh, LA, the uh, Countrywide Address Attack, I think that's the best translation. Uh, and they will look from the registration to the specific address and have a look who lives here uh, that should not be registered here, and who is registered here, uh, but is not here. And I found it very puzzling because these ghost youth 
they were not registered, registered right? You're not going to find them that way, or, or am I crazy? But yeah, that, that is certainly the motivation to act. Because the idea is that there is 50 million euros in fraud this way. Uh, so there's a business case to put people to work. And right now, 11 million is found, and almost 11 million is spent on the project. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's jobs. Yeah. I've defined a few rules like the ones you formulated. Uh, there are many more, I think, but just a few to give you an idea. Um, what I think are the main changes uh, that are the result of the, the digitalization of government. <coughs> Snowball effect. Hey, we, we we talked about uh, we talked about this, the correction waterfall. Because hey, the, the the snowball effect, just like real snowballs, works well one way. So if there's a mistake, like in the case of Saskia, you have to go to all these individual organizations to uh, make a uh, uh, correction, and be aware. A correction of your registration is not a correction of the original situation, hey, because if all connected consequences to that change, data makes blind. Hey, we also talked uh, about <coughs> this. In the case of Esther, you see a few things more. One I, th I, I call the butterfly effect, which was named by somebody in the, in the, in the back there. And that nobody knows what the consequences are of a change of uh, registration. And why is that? Because the data streams through legal domains. And nobody knows, and since nobody knows in what legal domains the data is used, nobody can say what the consequences are, because every organization has to judge in its own legal domain. Which also makes that a judgment, eh, which is justified in a legal way, cannot be made, because you don't know what the other consequences are. Butterfly effect. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, and this one as well. Uh, but this one was also almost uh, uh, named, which I call legal contamination by I ICT. Uh, Esther is not allowed to vote uh, anymore, even though uh, there is no connection at all between her nationality uh, and her registration uh, at the municipality. So since we only have five more minutes, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about what we could do uh, to solve this. I think to solve this in general, there are three groups of solutions needed. Uh, of course, because what was said uh, in the back over there, and uh, that the driving force behind the digitization of government uh, should change, yeah, because putting the citizen central just is not a business case. Uh, and uh, we have a, uh, a legal authority in the, in the Netherlands, which is called the Raad van State, yeah, the, the highest court. They very recently uh, put out an unrequested advice, uh, where they said, this is the root of all evil, uh, uh, so to say. So you have to think about that. The second thing is, of course, uh, which was also mentioned, is organize the learning uh, around these problems, because we only scrape the surface of knowing what actually happens, uh, especially certain potential technical solutions uh, are not ready in any, any way. Yeah? The, the number of research which has been done on data integrity over organizations, over several database systems, especially if you want to change things retroactively, uh, there is very scarce uh, research. Yeah? There is not such a thing as a foreign key at another organization. But thirdly, uh, I think we could put up some norms of good governance and ICT, I think. And part of these norms, um, I think, are 
not very contested uh, in the sense that it does not require uh, real political or organizational uh, decisions, but some are. For example, uh, the principle of consistency, the tax office, when they want to add money to your income, eh, toeslagen, they look at the registration in the municipality. If you're not there, no money. But on the other hand, Esther, she still had to pay tax. Everybody forgot about her, but she was always in the heart of the tax office. <laughs> because if you have to pay, the address is a flexible norm. <laughs> <laughs> so, that would, that would call for, and this of course requires a political decision. Also, principles of customization usually uh, require uh, uh, a political uh, uh, decision. But a lot of things don't. For example, principles of correction, I'll, I'll give you an example in a second. Nobody will say that uh, a government should not be able to correct its own mistakes, and which is the case now. In many cases, the government cannot correct its own mistakes. Uh, this is a technical problem. We can solve this tomorrow. No decisions needed. It's conform to law, no problem at all. Same with the principles of information. If you want to go to the judge right now, and you ask for a validated uh, uh, list of all your transactions for the tax office, you can't get it. And so you can't prove your status at a certain point in time. Uh, this is required by law. Oh, it's a technical problem. We can solve this tomorrow. So two principles, I will, I've, I've written 10 in this, in this book, if you like, the digital cage. Two I want to bring to the front in the final minutes. One is uh, one principle of customization, which is who decides automatically creates the possibility of, for human intervention. Because right now, most organizations have uh, entangled in their al algorithms the collection of data and the making of the decision. And so human interference is very difficult uh, because it's a single thing. Uh, if you want uh, non-governmental public bodies to play a part in uh, solving problems like this, first thing you have to do is make that possible, which means separate data collection and decision making so there is an option for human interference. And the second thing I would like to highlight in this principle <coughs> is no automatic consequences without automatic repair of consequences on correction. And this is an important one because it's really new. Eh? A few decades ago it was impossible to change somebody's data in 2,000 registrations as once. Uh, but now this is possible, eh? and it's in fact a new form of power, a power which requires uh, a, a legal protection for citizens, especially because uh, you can't expect a citizen to reconstruct the ICT governance and go to all these organizations. The world has changed, uh, I think, a new uh, protection is required. Thank you very much for having me. Are there any questions? Even if that costs too much, at the last time, I mean, uh, couldn't it be the fourth option to accept it and, like Neo in uh, The Matrix, see it as an abnormally and uh, have a good correction facility, for instance, for these people to have a judge and compensate her, but then accept these kind of things because it will cost a lot of money. Well, of course it is, but it's also something I think requires a small revolution, yeah, because in the Netherlands the idea is that you are judged on an individual basis, and rights are personal rights, that's the basis of liberal democracy. Uh, but of course, you, you, you could... But maybe, maybe it will never be uh, reached your ideal world that it's 100% uh, always for the uh, uh, citizen rights. And like I said, NEO was also an anomaly in a very complex world, yeah. and they started over six times, and every time there was 
the collateral damage. Yeah. Shouldn't you do but focus on the collateral don't damage? Don't forget, eh, every time when I research a case like this, I think this is such an absurd story. Okay. This must be one in a million. But every time again, I discover it's much more people than you think. How many esters do you estimate there to be? I, I mean, I, I think everybody agrees here that it is far too much for esters to cope with. That's not the problem. Remember how many, how many esters do you think there are? Thousands. I don't know. No, but what do you mean with how many esters? You mean the people that live like Esther or people that face the problems Esther faced? Yeah. Well, in fact, people who face problems like Esther and Saskia being, having a problem with more than five uh, non-governmental public bodies, a problem that is not solved after having more than five contacts with each of these five mm -hmm. organizations, that is now estimated at at least 27,500 people a year. If we calculate the same thing with uh, two organizations, more than five times, and you can't get it resolved. It's estimated on 500,000 people a year. So, only in the Netherlands. Three percent. Three percent of the population. So, cases of Esther, 27,500, <coughs> estimated by Beerschot in July last year. Thank you all. Thank you.